Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed the uh, session so far. Um, I'm going to start off my uh, track uh, with the topic IT transformation with containers and DevOps. Now, before we start looking into DevOps and containers, let us take a look at how companies are transforming from the IT perspective. Now, this is uh, something that has been talked about for many years, so I just want to give all of us right, a walkthrough before I actually dive into the key topic. Now, during the IT transformation journey itself, um, most companies will first have to decide what is their key business drivers. That's very important. All right? And most of the customers will tell me that you know, speed to market, agility, and quality is something that they are looking for to transform what they are doing today from the business channel as well as the business model perspective. Now, once the CIO all right, or CEO has defined the key business drivers, the next thing is to identify what are the key digital strategy we would like to map our key business drivers to. All right? We can talk about connected apps, intelligent recommendations, basically it's big data analytics. We talk about uh, innovation in the new markets that helps the business to create a new channels. Okay? Now, with that in mind, we then actually have to look towards what we have in the organization. That's the culture of change. Now, how is the organization going to transform from the IT perspective with the existing resources that the organization has? All right? So we need to understand from a few perspectives. And if you are in a regulated sector, especially banking, finance, telco, government, then you have to look into the perspective of governance and compliance. Now, that's where we will talk about DevOps and how do we going to change the teaming culture within an organization. And of course, last but not least, we're going to talk about technology. How are we going to map technology to the digital strategy they are going to adopt? That's very important. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about containers, Kubernetes, and microservices. So this is what you have, all right? The key four aspects that we need to consider when we actually embark on the IT transformation journey itself. Now today, the topic is about IT transformation with container and DevOps. So from the transformation perspective, all right, I'll be talking about two key enablers. One is the transformation internally within organization. That's where we're going to talk about DevOps, teaming culture. We'll look into the aspects of agile versus waterfall development approach. Then we look into the next aspects of IT transformation, that's external facing, which is the easiest to implement because that basically talks about technology. It's easy to pick up technology, all right? But it's not so easy to transform the internal working of your organization. So from technology perspective, we'll talk about containers, Kubernetes, as well as microservices. This is where we talk about how do we actually look into a monolith system? How do we actually move into microservices? All right, I'll talk a little bit about this. So from a transformation perspective, all right, we will first look into the internal change. How are we going to change internally all right, to enable my team to embark on this IT transformation journey? This is where we talk about DevOps. We talk about teaming culture. Now, if your organization is not on agile development approach, does it mean that you cannot transform your IT? The answer is no, because you can still implement DevOps with a waterfall approach. Okay. There's no right and wrong in doing DevOps. It's what is relevant to you at a point of time. So I'll talk a little bit more about DevOps in a short while. And then we talk about transforming outwards. That's external facing. So we're going to look into the aspects of infrastructure. All right? We're going to look into applications. That's where we're going to cover containers, Kubernetes, and Monolith uh, versus the microservice aspects itself. And this is how it's going to impact your agile operation aspects itself. Okay, so these are things that I'll talk about. So from the first perspective, where we talk about transforming internally, how can Red Hat help you? Now, Red Hat has two programs that we can help you. One is with the transformation workshop, where we kind of like work with you to identify what is your key business strategy and your digital uh, strategy they're going to embark on after knowing your business uh, needs. And then we're going to run a 10 days program where we're going to navigate through your organization's um, key infrastructure, software infrastructure, and we're going to do a map all right, to what we have from Red Hat. And finally, we will then make use of the Pathfinder program, where we're going to pick one or two of your application to identify how you're going to migrate or refactor some of your monolith capability into microservices. Okay, so this is the first program that we have. Now, the second program that we have is where we have the Open Innovation Labs. 
Now, if you are already doing Agile, but not, not at to the level that you're expecting, or you're trying to embark on Agile, right? first time doing, but you do not know what to do, but you've attended all the courses. So how can Red Hat help you? Now, we have the Open Innovation Labs, where we actually provide a program, a residency program. We help you set up the environment all right, with containers, and we help you to actually run through four to six sprints all right, in the Agile Scrum approach, so that we grill your development team. All right? That's where you train your master memory, yeah? such that you know, every day becomes a normal topic you know, when you talk about Agile. And then end of the residency program, all right, you probably will have something that you can actually take back all right, into your organization and deploy it and run. Okay, again, depending on the skill set. You know, it's, 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 like, it's like the tuition. Uh. You know who have kids here? Many, right? You send your kids to tuition. You have, right? So what you learn in school, you know, if your kids are not good, you send them for tuition. Okay, Open Innovation Lab is like giving you a good tuition. Okay, we train you to make sure that you reach to a certain quality. Okay? So that's what we have, right, from the taming culture perspective, how, how Red Hat can help you. Then we talk about DevOps. Oh, DevOps is something very close to my heart. Now, before I actually talk about DevOps, I'd like to federate our understanding of DevOps. All right, DevOps is not a product. It's not a framework either. Okay? DevOps, according to Wikipedia, is about a set of practice that focus on communication and collaboration across your team. Development, testing, security, QA, your PMO, as well as auditor. All right? That's where we talk about teaming culture. Okay? And one of the key implementation success criteria for DevOps is actually automation. All right? So this is where we're going to come into discussing how many types of DevOps do we have? Now, a lot of you will say that DevOps is CI, CD, right? Well, that is not right. That's not wrong either. When I look into CI, CD, all right, that is, to me, I call it regular DevOps. But when I actually talk about DevOps, in a regulated industry, okay? I need to cover more than a regular DevOps. It's more than CI, CD. I need to talk about continuous security. I need to talk about continuous compliance. So how does all this fit into your DevOps practice itself? Okay? So if you are working in a regulated industry, I would recommend you to actually relook at your DevOps strategy, all right? Focus more into the regulated DevOps itself, where there are six key areas that you need to focus. All right, the first area is your process model. And this is where we will orchestrate all your DevOps activities. All right, and this is where we ensure you are meeting your governance and compliance aspects itself. That's where we get continuous compliance and security. Now, why do I talk about compliance security? What has process model got to do with security? Now, imagine if I'm able to control all my DevOps activities, Starting from my source code, that's why we have the second area, workspace management. It's important, all right? Managing your source code is managing your asset. Because if you don't manage your source code properly, what's going to happen is that some group developer is going to add some logic into your application and just go to production. If you talk about CI, CD, press the button, pop. My codes get compiled, my codes get tested automatically, all right? And then it goes into production. That's regular, regular DevOps, yeah? But when you're working in the regulator industry, you know that such thing will never happen. Because there's a gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper is your QA team, or maybe your security team. Or perhaps your end user who like to do user experience testing right, before you roll it out. So you can see that different customer has different needs when it comes to DevOps. It really depends on which sector you're operating in and what are your needs. Okay? So as I said early on, all right, Security is also related to your workspace because that's where you control all right, how your source code is being worked on. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. How many of you here are sure that today your developers are using a source code that represents your current production baseline when they're doing their change request? You are sure? Yes? Great. If you are sure, it's good. If you are not sure, then it becomes a big problem, right? If I have a production release is running version 2.3, and my developer are using version 1.5 source code. What's going to happen when the new changes are rolled out to production? You say goodbye to all your feature set that we introduced in release 2.3. That is a big compliance issue, and it impacts your security as well. All right? That's the reason why we need to look into workspace management. 
And most CI discussion doesn't talk much about workspace management. They talk about having a hook that triggers off. Upon check-in, I start my build. That's why I'm going to talk about the next topic, build management. All right? Interesting, build management. Where are you building your application? On your laptop? Or you have a build server? If you have a build server, that's great, because you're going to have, have a standard operating environment. Now, if you're building in your laptop, and then you're storing a runtime somewhere in your laptop, and you're going to deploy this runtime to production, I'll say good luck to you, all right? Because there are compliance issues, because virus can get in. Someone might change your runtime, all right? That's the difference, again, between the regular and regulated DevOps. So when you talk about build management, and when you talk about having a build environment, with standard operating environment, which you talk about libraries, all right? What are the libraries, the frameworks that I'm using to build my runtime that I'm going to deploy into production? And we're going to talk about build once multiple deployment, all right? I know a lot of clients does this. When they go to SIT, they build one time. They go to UAT, they build one time. When they go to production, they build another time. You know, why, why are we spending so much time building, all right? Oh, then they'll tell me because, oh, I can't control my source code. You see, it goes all the way back to workspace management again, right? Now, if you are building your application in different environment, you might have an issue where you have code drift. You know developers, right? Uh, they always go by left, huh? Under pressure, right? So when I have problems in SIT, I don't fix my code in my development environment. I go to my SIT environment and fix my code. What happens now? You have a code drift. Because the developers say, anyway, I'm going to rebuild, right? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for that release. But it matters for the rest of your build pipeline integrity. Imagine if you are doing parallel development. This becomes an issue, OK? So when we talk about build management, it's important that we build in a controlled environment. And the outcome or the output of the build itself must be published to a SCM repository. This is where you store the history, all right? of when the build was created and who created it. Very important. So this is the first part we talk about CI, right? Extended CI. Lots of things, right? So it's not just about triggering a hook upon check-in, then you do a build. No, it's not that. Then we talk about release management. That's uh, area four. Release management is the easiest part. This is because it's about automatically deploying your application all right, into your target environment. So the question here is, how do I automate my release management? A lot of customers will do manual deployment in SIT, UAT. And finally, when they go into production, oh, they have a script that does the deployment to production. Um, my recommendation you know, for regulated DevOps is to keep your build script and your deployment script as part of your source code. So that becomes your single source of truth. And at any point of time, when I need to rebuild my environment, I know how to rebuild my application, I know how to deploy my application, regardless of the target environment. Is it SIT, UAT, or maybe production itself? OK? So this is where we're going to talk about release management and how it ties all the way back to workspace management again. We will need to have a single source of truth. OK? And finally, release management that does the automated release. Release to where? Release to an environment. How are you managing environment? All right? Are you managing environment in terms of VMs, or is it bare matter, or is it in terms of projects? But this is where, you know, if you're working on containers, it helps. All right? Technology impacts your DevOps practice. It's very important. So you're running monolith system versus container-based system. All right? Your DevOps practice will be different, but the six key areas are the same. You will never change. OK? So in terms of environment management, that's where we talk about you know, how do I have an, uh, a strategy where I do a build and pare down approach? Why do I do that? Because I want to consolidate all my infrastructure. When I need my SIT, I bring it up. When I'm done with my SIT, I tear it down. So everybody can share a common pool of infrastructure. And this is how it's going to help, all right? Optimizing and increasing the uh, productivity of the people as well as the resource. And last but not least, test management. All right? Test management exists everywhere today, right? Everyone does testing, whether it's formal or informal. And the test management aspects itself will focus on the consumption of your SIT and UAT environment. Okay? And they are the gatekeeper 
when you actually transform your source code to runtime before it gets promoted into production itself. All right. Okay, I've talked a lot about DevOps. There are a lot more to talk about, but I guess you know, I need to move on. So this is what I want to focus on, regulated DevOps. All right? If you are doing regular DevOps today, maybe you, need, you might want to consider how to move into a regulated DevOps if you're in a regulated industry. So how, do, how does everything stack together? Now that I've defined my DevOps practice itself, the next thing is to bring in all right, how I'm doing my development. Am I doing cloud native apps? All right. Now, I can achieve having a cloud native apps by doing agile or waterfall approach. It doesn't matter. Okay? I can have small waterfall. It is very close to doing agile. All right? But the key thing about creating a cloud native application is the 12 factors all right, of creating the application. And one of the key ones that I always remember is don't ever do logging to a local file system because that's no longer cloud native because you're going to tie your application to the environment. That's no good. That's not going to support your agile operation later on. Okay? So that's something you look at. Now, of course, once I have my application, where do I deploy it to? This is where we talk about you having a multi-cloud strategy. All right? You might have a private cloud. You might want to actually spin up some loads to the public cloud when you run out. Or I just want to manage a bunch of VMs. All right? So that is, that is part of the infrastructure we're going to run our application on. And you can see that the DevOps practice is going to help you push all right, your source code, transform to a runtime, push it into the test environment, all right, tear down the test environment once I'm done with it before I actually deploy my production environment. And that's where we talk about, finally, the management and automation aspects of it. How do I manage my runtime? How do I automate all right, how this highway that I've just built using the six key areas that define a regulated DevOps? Okay. Now, of course, next, I'm going to cover technology. Now, all of us know what is container, right? Okay, those who do not know, then I just summarize, right? It's a lightweight VM without the OS. That's how light it is. And because it is light, it's able to scale up very quickly. And that's the reason why many of us are actually looking into containers, because we're able to scale out our application. And if, when we're able to scale our application, what does it mean to the operation team? All right? It means agile operation. I'm able to spin up all right, and scale up my application as and when my load comes in. Now, when the load comes in, we need to manage all these containers. This is where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes will manage a few things. All right? You help us to manage the container at scale. You manage the security aspects. And it will actually help us integrate into an IT operation that results in agile practices. Okay? When I run out of resources, I just add to the underlying node. That's it. I don't really have to touch my application because my application is container-based. It does, it does know how to scale up on its own. Okay? And the good thing is, Kubernetes runs on hybrid cloud. That's important, right? And this is how you're going to support your multi-cloud strategy. So you can see that everyone is talking about Kubernetes today, right? If you use container, you definitely use Kubernetes. A bit of product selling here. Okay, so I have OpenShift Container Platform. Now, a lot of clients that I talk to will associate OpenShift Container Platform to Kubernetes. Uh, it's not that true. Huh? Kubernetes is part of what we have in OpenShift. OpenShift has more than Kubernetes. Okay? You can see that in OpenShift, we provide CI, CD capabilities, all right? service catalog, container registry. We talk about security. We talk about console, we talk about SDN networking, we talk about storage, we talk about logging and monitoring. These are additional capabilities that we're building right, on top of Kubernetes, and we present to you in the form of OCP, OpenShift Container Platform. And the good thing about OCP is that we will provide a layer of developer experience. That's why we thought, you know, the green aspects, we have all our Red Hat middleware stuff that runs on it. So it makes the adoption of technology so much easier right, in your OCP, which is your platform as a service. So now I no longer have to worry right, about my software infrastructure. Right? Let OpenShift manage all these things for you. And then you focus on your KPI, which is to build software, and it's not to build the platform. Yeah? Leave, leave, it, leave that to Red Hat. Okay. So in terms of OCP, OCP enables IT transformation from a few perspectives. One is resiliency. 
when we talk about self-healing. This is where we talk about, you know, your application running on a container that goes out. All right, OCB can automatically bring up your pods again. Okay, self-healing. We talk about scalability. All right, when your load comes in, hitting your containers, all right, your pods. All right, what we can do is we configure a threshold. When we reach to a certain limit, we're going to scale up my pods. That's how we do scaling up. And when my load reduces, I scale down. This time I'm going to save all right, my infrastructure costs instead of doing one lump sum investment for my project. Then we talk about portability. The application container image that we built on OCP can run on OCP that is running on the bare metal or on a VM or on a cloud that's public or private. All right, I have clients who run hybrid OCP deployment, OCP on premise as well as OCP on the cloud. They basically segregate all right, the sensitivity of the application. Data that is sensitive to the organization, they will actually run those applications on the on premise. And those client facing applications they run OCP in the public cloud. And of course, they have microservices that connect to one another, all right? From the public cloud to the on premise aspect itself. Then, of course, OCP gives you added security, all right? And OCP provides the multi tenancy capability. That's where we talk about security, okay? Now, to put it all together, how it looks like is this. I have my default practice, all right? I know how my application will be built. Hopefully, we are building cloud-native application, okay? And we're going to have OpenShift as the platform and service that's going to be running on your multi-cloud strategy infrastructure, okay? So what we do is that we manage everything at the OpenShift level. Take that as a pass, okay? This, this will basically lighten the workload of the operation team. The operation team just need to manage those resources that actually supports OpenShift, all right, OCP. That's basically talking about the memory, the worker nodes, eh? the memory, the CPU, et cetera. Now, of course, we're going to implement the management and automation aspects of how we transform all right, a source code to runtime before it's accredited, and then we finally deploy to production. Okay? And how OCP enables that FOPS. It's very interesting, right? I kind of summarize all right, uh, what uh, capability we have from OCP that maps to the key uh, six areas that I've talked about. All right, first is the process model where we can integrate OCP to the, a process workflow, all right, using the OC client, all right, and then we can uh, make use of the process model to control. You know, how do I create a development branch regardless of what SCM tools you have, all right, and how do I do a code freeze to create a release branch? Now, of course, uh, area two we talk about workspace management. Uh, this is where uh, no, OCP doesn't play a part. That's where you talk about your respective SCM uh, solution that you have. Then we talk about build management with a S2I capability, plus OCP provides you a, with a controlled build server because we will create a build project itself where we will build all our application, all right, container image from the project itself. So we have all the history. We have rights. Who can access to the build server itself, all right, with all the builder image, which is part of your conflict management that we talk about, which is the extension, all right, uh, usually in the level one DevOps that I've talked about with my client. When we talk about release management, we're going to leverage all right, uh, projects that's, that's equivalent okay, to environment. So I can create S multiple SIT UAT environment as and when I need it. I tear it down when I finish all my testing. This is where I talk about uh, having the, the tag and having the, the creation of OCB project. All right, uh, on OpenShift itself. Then we have environment management. This is where we talk about creating the projects. All right, and then we talk about the test management, where OpenShift can helps you create multiple test environment. Which means that if you are doing parallel development, you are now able to do parallel testing. All right. Traditionally, what happens is that you know I can do parallel development, but I only have one instance of SIT or UAT, which means everyone one will have to wait. You know, it's like funner. So what do we do? Hey, let's go coffee. Yeah. All right. And productivity goes up. So with OpenShift itself, we kind of like federate and increase productivity by providing right, on the fly the testing environment that's needed by the development team. Okay, okay I'm going to spend the last five minutes to talk about IT transformation that's happening in this part of the world, right, Asia Pack. First, we have Macquarie Bank. Then we talk about Cathay Pacific. And then we talk about Pioneer. Okay. Now, all these are Red Hat's clients 
who have embarked on the IT transformation journey with Red Hat uh, by implementing OpenShift as a core technology all right, with other uh, Red Hat uh, offerings, right? for example, Macquarie Bank. Okay? Their objective all right, is to increase their time to market. Okay? And then they want to create impact on their business. This is where they, we talk about the digital first banking uh, in Australia, where they reshape how the uh, Australian are actually doing banking. All right? And in this uh, situation, all right, uh, more, than six, more than 60 business critical applications were migrated all right, onto OpenShift. That's how aggressive they are. Okay? I want to talk a little bit about Cathay Pacific. All right? Cathay Pacific is, uh, is interesting. All right? uh, they wanted to increase their market size by creating um, apps that actually draws customer all right, to ride on their planes. And what do they do is that they actually embark on OpenShift, OpenStack, all right, as well as the um, uh, um, applications okay, where they actually migrated 50 B2C applications onto OpenShift okay, uh, over a year. That's how aggressive it is. Of course, Red Hat was uh, one of the key uh, partners with them. Okay? And last but not least, we have Pioneer. All right. Again, Pioneer wanted to work on something all right, where they can scale up all right, the capability they're providing to their clients. All right. Again, this is where uh, they actually made use of uh, OpenShift container platform all right, to actually create those applications that, uh, that allows right, applications to scale up all right, and scale down as and when the load actually uh, kind of like increases. Okay, with that, what I've done is that I've finished my presentation. Is there any question? Nope. If not, I thank you. You have a great day ahead. <laughs>